So what is the Parkinson pandemic? So what we're seeing, unfortunately, is that Parkinson's is the fastest growing neurological condition in the world. Uh, this is partially because of aging. Uh, we all get older, which is a blessing, um, which means we will see more Alzheimer's, we'll see more strokes, uh, we'll see more epilepsy. But if you correct for aging, Alzheimer's actually remains more or less stable, maybe even declines a little bit. Stroke is declining because we're better at preventing stroke. But the one condition that continues to accelerate, even after you accommodate for the aging effect, is Parkinson's. And obviously, this is not because there's a new genetic cause suddenly around. We think this is because of exposure to environmental toxins, and in particular, pesticides, um, solvents like trichloroethylene, heavy metals, uh, and the like. We're particularly concerned about the pesticides. So what do we know about how pesticides are actually impacting the gut or the brain of somebody with Parkinson's, but it's not having that same effect on people with Alzheimer's if it's, if it's staying stable and it's not growing like Paul Parkinson's is? Right. So, so one thing that makes um, Parkinson's such a, I would say, vulnerable condition is we know that, for example, Paraquat and Rotenone uh, to widely used pesticides. Uh, Paraquat, by the way, has been banned in 60 countries in the world, including China, not in the United States, which is incredible. Paraquat is an inhibitor of uh, complex one, and complex one is part of the breathing system of nerve cells. And uh, the substantia nigra, the black matter, the area in the brain that's primarily affected in Parkinson's, is very active. It's metabolically very active. So that area is particularly sensitive and more so than other areas in the brain to blocks of this breathing system in the nerve cells. So paraquat is very toxic to the substantia nigra. So is rotenone, so are many other pesticides. And that is very different from brain cells in the cortex where, where the nature of Alzheimer lies. Okay, that's great. So why, why is this all happening now? We can look back and say, well, paraquat and glyphosate and all of those things were sort of introduced into the, like they were everywhere in where the seventies and so, or sixties even, and then now these people are just old enough that that long-term accumulation of those pesticides or what's happening is, what else is going on? No, well, I think your point is, is, is exactly that. We know that pesticides have been introduced worldwide after World War I, so it started in the fifties to feed a rapidly growing world population. We needed healthy crops. And obviously people are now exposed to these pesticides either through well water, but pesticides have been shown in demonstrable concentrations in milk in the supermarkets. So it reaches the food chain. Um, and of course in doses that are not enough to acutely cause Parkinson's as you would do in a, in a, in a, in a mouse who you give a high dose of paraquat accumulative doses over time combined with aging is what is leading now to the pandemic. The, the people who are young in their 50s drinking lots of milk. We, we, we used to have advertisers on Dutch television and, 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 and we were recommended as children to drink three big glasses of milk each day. And that generation combined with aging is now developing Parkinson's. Interesting. So on the, the milk thing, when people talk about how dairy is bad for you, bad for your health, not great for somebody, um, you know, it's, it can help not bring on Parkinson's. Is it because dairy or is it because of the pesticides in the dairy? Because I think no, that's it, definitely yeah. a big con confusing point for people. No, there, that's a, so it's good to clarify. We, we think that dairy products across the board, so it's, it's cheese, it's yogurt, it's, it's milk, are dangerous because of the pesticides that are contained within them. It's not the dairy itself. And once people have Parkinson's, it's important to spread your proteinaceous meals, including the intake of dairy across the day. So to avoid peaks, because that interferes with the absorption of levodopa in the gut. But at the same time, people shouldn't get rid of proteins and dairy products altogether because women after the age of 50 are prone to osteoporosis and milk is still vital to prevent vitamin D deficiencies. So if people can consider taking proteins and, and, and dairy products, spread them across the day. 
instead of taking peaks and, and, and try to avoid simultaneous intake with medication. And now that we're at it, I'm increasingly seeing how important a regular check for vitamin D is, particularly in, in elderly women, but maybe also in men. Uh, people with Parkinson's for some reasons are prone to develop a vitamin D deficiency. It's good for your bone health if, it, if it's up. And there have been some fascinating anecdotes of people taking vitamin D who improved miraculously. Don't take it if you are good on vitamin D. Any compound can be toxic, including vitamin D, but have it measured occasionally. And if it's down, it. Okay, so um, when it comes to dairy, is there a way to avoid pesticides and dairy products? Is there any dairy, are there any dairy products that don't? Is this like, oh, well, I'm eating, drinking organic milk or organic, what have you, I'm, I'm fine. Is that the case or no? Um, I'm a neurologist, so I will tell you what I know and I will honestly tell you what I don't know. I can tell you that I'm a believer in organic food. I, we eat organic with my family. Um, I can't guarantee that organic food is safe, uh, uh, but I think overall from what I read and what I hear is that organic food is simply safer than um, the regular run of the mill stuff. Mm -hmm. But I can't guarantee, I'm not a biologist. Yeah. I'm a believer, not a biologist. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so knowing what we know about the environment and the different things that we put in our bodies, what can we do about it? What What is the goal for ending Parkinson's and whether you have, you don't have it now, but maybe you have somebody in your family who has it or you have it, what can we do? Right, well, let's separate when you want to avoid de developing Parkinson's from what you can do when you have Parkinson's. I think the there is evidence from epidemiology that looks at associations and an association means that there is a relationship between a factor and the risk of Parkinson's. For example, lifetime risk of a lifetime cumulative intake of dairy products increases the risk of developing Parkinson's. Um, that's not the same as a causal effect. In order to prove that, you would have to do a trial where you randomize people to lower their dairy intake and to see that Parkinson's is actually less. So these are associations. So as an example to, to, to people who listen to this, um, um, when the, oh, what, what is the bird that brings the babies? What, what's the name in English? Uh, the pigeon? Or no, the, no, um, the, the um, oh my gosh, somebody took my tongue. I can't think of it. But yes, it comes along with the stork, sorry. The stork, the stork, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, the disappearance of the stork in the Netherlands went hand in hand with a reduction in the growth of the number of children. But that doesn't prove that the stork brings the babies. It's an association, but it's not a causal relationship. Mm -hmm. So there are many associations which we think could be causal, but they're not definitive. So what, what we see is that dairy products are maybe avoided. Physical activity, the more active people are, and I think the followers of the Davis Finney Foundation will be really interested in this. Exercise seems to protect against the risk of Parkinson's. Could be spurious, right? Maybe if you are underway of developing Parkinson's, you're already less prone to exercise. So we're not sure yet, but it looks like regular exercise can help to prevent your risk of developing the disease. A Mediterranean diet, regular coffee intake. But for all of those, I can think alternative explanations. So I think when I see people now who have a family member with Parkinson's, who maybe have a, a gene that is a risk for developing Parkinson's. I tell them exercise, if possible, on a daily basis. Eat Mediterranean food, eat dark fruit, three or four cups of coffee per day, and try to avoid dairy products if you can, and eat organic. That's what I tell people. Mm -hmm. Can I tell them that this is a definitive recipe for protection? No, I can't. Great. Does it make sense? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, what about people that have Parkinson's is there anything they can do or make you know choices every day aside from exercise um, that can help their you know progression of Parkinson's? Well, I'm going to start with exercise anyway. You know, um, this is the Davis Finney Foundation. I mean, Davis is my hero. Can I just make that disclaimer? Uh, yes, I. So he, he he is this. The, it's right back at you. He feels the same way. <laughs> I know. You? I know. We're. I'm. Um, 
I mean, he is such society. a he is such a wonderful and inspiring man. And 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 um, and what I find really cool and important for all the followers of the Davis Finney Foundation is exercise does at least four things. One is it's just good for any citizen. Forget Parkinson's. It's good for your bone health, for your heart. Helps to prevent dementia. It's good for every heart, lungs. Two, exercise may prevent the risk of developing Parkinson's, as we said earlier. Three, if you already have Parkinson's, it works like a drug. It suppresses the symptoms. And this is not belief. This is now underpinned by good scientific evidence. And four, we think that maybe, maybe, if anything in the world right now can slow down the progression of Parkinson's, it's regular exercise. We published a paper last year in Lancet Neurology where exercising three times a week for 30 minutes at about 80% of your maximum stopped the progression of motor symptoms. So people who were just doing stretching exercises declined over time, which is what you would expect in Parkinson's. It's a progressive condition. The exercises stabilized their motor symptoms. And we just submitted a paper, it's under review now, where we did brain scans before and after stretching in the control group and before and after exercise in the cycling group. And lo and behold, in the controls, the brain was shrinking a little bit over six months time. It happens in you, happens in me. It didn't happen in the exercising Parkinson patients. And in addition, the exercising patients made new brain connections between their diseased basal ganglia and the healthy cortex. Now, if there's anybody at the other end of the line who is not motivated to the bone to pick up exercise now, I've done a bad job today. <laughs> right, I was gonna say, if there's ever a reason. Right. The science is there, yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, so I kind of want to move on a little bit to optimal care for people who sure. currently have Parkinson's. So what, what, are, what have you observed about patients who live well with Parkinson's? What, what do they do? And what do they do that others don't do? I think this is a brilliant question. Um, I didn't prepare for this, so I'll speak straight from the heart. I think people who do well are people who accept the disease. I think the people who fare worst is the people who fail to accept that Parkinson's is there and it's there to stay. And I wish I could say something else, but we can't cure Parkinson's. People who, after a period of sorrow and despair, which I understand, say, all right, hang on, it's there. I'm gonna accept that the fact it's there. I'm gonna get on with my life and fight with the beast those are the people that do better than the people who keep denying, who deny it to their spouse, who deny it to their family, who deny it to their colleagues at work, who are in constant um, pain about, you know, they have never accepted the disease. That's one. I think optimism and hope is important. Um, and can I just say that this is a time for people with Parkinson's to have hope? I will make no false promises, but I tell all my patients, I had my clinic today, I tell all my patients, Parkinson's today is a different disease compared to 10 years ago, and it's a way different disease compared to 20 years ago. We have better treatments, better drugs, we better understand deep brain surgery. There is 10, 20, 30 drugs in the pipeline that could potentially slow down Parkinson's. We may come to that later. It's a time of hope. We have now multidisciplinary care. We understand that patients are not objects, but are subjects who actively contribute to their own health. This is a new world. And I'm not saying it's nice or ideal to have Parkinson's, but it, it's a time of hope. So optimis, optimism helps, acceptance helps. I think a strong family helps, um, you know, a supportive spouse. And I, I, when I say this, I get the goosebumps because I see wonderful families, amazing families. But I sometimes see people left in the dark. Mm -hmm. We know that divorces happen a bit more often. Um, you know, the relationship is under strain. I mean, we have to be fair and honest about that. People who fight it as a couple, as a family, do better. And I think every patient with Parkinson's, wherever you live, has the right, you know, the inborn right to see a good medical team. And we know that people in the United States 
one in three Parkinson patients in the United States does not have a neurologist. And those who do not have a neurologist, this is published work, your country, 21st first century, are more likely to end up in a nursing home, are more likely to fracture their hip, and are more likely to die. This today. Mm -hmm. So you have a right to see a neurologist, preferably somebody with expertise in movement disorders. You have the right to see a Parkinson nurse. You have the right to see a multidisciplinary team if needed. And I know that dream is still a bit far away, but try to get the best care that you deserve. And if you can't see the doctor in person, make sure the doctor comes to see you in your house as we are doing today through telemedicine. Yeah, absolutely. So a little bit about that. What does, you know, somebody who's doing really well and not to, um, you know, take away from people who don't have that access. If they did have that access, what does an ideal care team look like? What, what is that multidisciplinary approach that you talk about uh, that we're certainly trying in different areas in the United States? We are nowhere near where we should be, but um, what can we work toward? Um, it's always personalized. So um, I've just submitted a paper to The Lancet. I uh, was invited to write a review for The Lancet. And what we propose is that each patient should always have a neurologist or a geriatrician, depends on the country where you live, supported by a Parkinson nurse as a team, and a general practitioner, a family doctor, supported by a community nurse. They, they should always be involved in every patient. And then there is a second ring of commonly involved disciplines, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech language, dietitians, uh, uh, maybe a rehabilitation specialist. Sleep is a very common and vexing issue. And then there is an outer sort of circle and it includes an incredible amount of disciplines, a urologist, a gastroenterologist, an ophthalmologist. Palliative care, I think is neglected and underestimated is very important. A dentist with some understanding of Parkinson's. So theoretically, the, the team can include up to 30 disciplines. In reality, it's tailor-made to your needs. Always a neurologist and a nurse, plus a GP, family practitioner, and a community nurse, and the others as needed. Great. Um, so switching gears a little bit, there was a recent article that came out that said, uh, in Science Daily that said Parkinson's disease is not one, but two diseases. What, what, what of that? What should we make of that? What does that mean for people with Parkinson's and how does it you know, impact them? I can um, tell the viewers that hopefully if the Lancet accepts our paper, what we are proposing is that there are 7 million Parkinson's diseases. Uh, I don't think Parkinson's disease exists and everybody has a unique different Parkinson's disease. Um, it's because A, the wishes and needs of each patient are different and family. Two, because the way the disease presents itself is different. There are people with a tremor, without a tremor, and I see patients every day, and there are no two identical. Three, there are at least eight genes involved, plus a range of environmental factors, plus a range of unknown factors. So even at the etiological level, it isn't one disease. So the title of our Lancet paper is The Parkinson Diseases, but I wouldn't say there are two, there are 7 million. Wow, okay. Is that why the cure is so elusive? It's just you're trying to cure 7 million N of one cases? <laughs> Well, the 7 million is more about the personalized elements. I think you can cluster, of course, among these 7 million, but you're absolutely right because it isn't one disease, there isn't one cure. And what we're now seeing is that all the different drugs that are under development to hopefully one day modify the course of Parkinson's are specifically focusing on either LARC2 Parkinson's disease is one of the genetic forms or on GBA Parkinsonism, uh, or they tackle the mitochondrial process which is playing a role in many, but maybe not all patients. Mm -hmm. So I think the idea that a one size fits all treatment will cure all of Parkinson's, I think is elusive. We, but, but I don't think we need 7 million treatments. Mm -hmm. uh, we will need a cluster of treatments, maybe in interaction 
to one day eradicate this disease from the planet. Yeah, so that's a really, the, this idea is a very good argument for people mm -hmm. to see a movement disorder specialist. Um, Absolutely. Because if, you know, their, their general practitioner is likely not going to be able to understand all of those different pieces. And so getting the meds right, like if you have very different um, symptoms and they come at different times and they're triggered by different things. Well, your doctor needs to so understand how all of those medicines work um, and how they might interact with other medicines that you have to target your specific situation. So you can have all the conversations that you want at your Parkinson's support group. And it's like, oh, well, my doctor took me off of 35 milligram, whatever it is. And um, it's meaningless unless your tr not doctor knows your true situation. Um, Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. All right. Um, so we are going to have a really um, interesting uh, webinar later or next week on medicines for motor symptoms um, and talking about all of the different medicines that are here. We just created a new um, we just created a new thing for our website that just has every Parkinson's medication. And like you said, all those in the pipeline. It's amazing how many drugs are in the pipeline right now. Um, but what can we talk about in terms of non-pharmacological interventions um, that work well? And is there anything that in, you know, out there that you're particularly excited about and curious about in this space for treatments? Well, I'm, I think the good news is that um, the evidence to support non-pharmacological interventions is growing by the day. Um, when I started my scientific career, physiothera I was always a believer in physiotherapy. So like, like Davis, uh, I was a former elite sportsman, although not at his level. I did play in the Dutch Premier League at the highest level. I did play for the national volleyball team, the under 18, um, uh, but never, never, never to the extent, you know, that were, like Davis, uh, Olympic Games. Um, but as an athlete, I developed a belief in physiotherapy. But when I started my scientific career, the evidence was really weak. It wasn't more than a belief. Today, physiotherapy is an evidence-based intervention robust clinical evidence and trial evidence to support the merits. There's good evidence for occupational therapy. There's good evidence for speech and language therapy. But for example, there is still little evidence for dietary interventions. Um, the, the role of nurses, which we all strongly believe in, and I would invest all my money in nurses, is never scientifically demonstrated. The trials that have been done were actually quite disappointing. The evidence to support a multidisciplinary team approach is also growing. That's getting better and better. So the, the sum of all the components is less good than the integrated true multidisciplinary approach. So the, the good news is that the evidence is growing in particular for the allied health interventions. Um, we're also seeing technological developments that are being helpful. For example, we published this paper on laser shoes where people were wearing a shoe where a laser beam would project from the nose of the shoe so the other foot could step over the laser beam. In a trial, we showed this to be positive and there are now other trials with different types of interventions, smart glasses, tactile cueing, like fibro tactile cueing. So th the world is developing fast and I think that's good news for people with Parkinson's. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit more about nurses? I, it's not something that we talk much about. Uh, we tend to focus a lot on the PT or the MDS and all of that. Oh. What role um, for, I know that you, you know, your clinic is a multidisciplinary clinic. What, what role does the nurse play and why is that so critical and, and what can be done uh, to make right. that more of a, of a thing for everybody with Parkinson's? Well, the, the, the nurses play many different roles in our team. I think the nurses by nature of their background are much better at many of the non-motor problems that happen in Parkinson's like sleep or sex or constipation or relationships. So they're very good at the non-motor symptoms. The nurses in, in our team are also the coordinator of the team. Um, it's like a football team. If they all run around in a different direction, you know, somebody needs to tell the football team how to, how to act together. So they coordinate the team. They are also the liaison between the hospital and the community services because healthcare tends to be very siloed. And if we work in a silo, you can think a beautiful plan, you conceive a beautiful plan in the hospital, 
But if it's never been implemented in a community, the patient isn't going to benefit. So the nurse is also the liaison to the community. And some of our nurses have taken special courses. So they are now called nurse practitioners or specialized nurse practitioners. So they can do prescribed medication. Um, what we now are going to do in the next phase is having the truly built nurse-led care. So the standard of care in my country, many places in the world, is that patients see a doctor, a neurologist or geriatrician, episodically, like two to four times a year. And we tend to be reactive. So we wait for problems to arise, and then we try to fix them. We want to move towards nurse-led care, where patients monitor themselves at home using either digital diaries or wearable sensors. Parkinson's is a very measurable condition. Those data from those two sources are fed into a dashboard. The nurse monitors the dashboard. And if all traffic lights are green, don't go see the doctor, go exercise, go have fun with your grandchildren. If a traffic light turns orange, not red, the nurse proactively intervenes and kills the fire you know now in the United States and California what happens if you don't kill the fire on time. Before you know it, the whole forest is on fire. So the nurse is proactive and is the first point of access. So rather than the neurologist being the first point of access, the nurse is the first point of access. And the nurse can solve many problems. And if he or she cannot solve the problem, the nurse knows exactly who in the team can. So the, the nurse is also like the director of a orchestra and navigates the patients through the jungle of healthcare to the right persons. So as an example, I see patients who wait for three, four months to see Professor Bloom. And they sit in my office and they say, I'm very lonely. And I tell them that's horrible, but I'm not the right person to address loneliness. I'm, I'm not good at it and I'm way too expensive. And I'm too late because you waited for four months, three problems. If you now have a nurse proactively intervening and finding and saying, oh, but if it's loneliness, then the social worker should intervene or you know, whoever. I've had patients waiting for the same four months and they said, oh, I've got such a sore knee. And I look at it and it's an anterior cruciate. And they think, oh, but I thought it was Parkinson's. And the nurse knows that a bad knee is unlikely to be a Parkinson problem. Mm -hmm. So first point of access, easily accessible, solve problems quickly before they go awry or navigate into the right direction, which means sometimes the nurse thinks it's a good idea that I get involved. Now that's a different role for doctors. We need to step down from our throne. We are one of the guys in the team or the girls. And if the nurse thinks it's a good idea that I become involved, then it's only then that I become active. When you were just starting like Parkinson Net and this whole idea of a multidisciplinary approach and a care team, what were some of the um, obstacles that you faced in trying to get it together? I mean, I, I assume there had to have been naysayers or we can't oh, yeah. do this or it's too expensive or it's not possible, it's not feasible, and you, you made it work. What are, what are the barriers to it? Well, I think there, we, we've seen a number of barriers and it's a very good question because I always say I can speak for an hour about the successes of Parkinson it, but I can speak for four hours <laughs> about all the failures and the troubles. One of the troubles is, for example, we have 20,000 physiotherapists in my country and, and I like physios. I think they're all good, but not all of them. I, I think their baseline, Parkinson's is such a complex condition that when you've had your baseline education in physiotherapy school, you're probably a very good physiotherapist, but you're not yet there at the level that is required to deliver optimal Parkinson care. So what Parkinson is doing is bringing up the level of expertise to an even higher level that's required for Parkinson care and to concentrate care among those therapists. My country has 50,000 patients, over 20,000 therapists, which means you will treat one or two patients at best. Now, thanks to Parkinson, we have therapists treating over a hundred patients. So not only have they had their baseline course, but they become better and better because of the training. And the resistance we meet is for example, by the physiotherapy training board, 
who said, we think that all our therapists deserve to treat Parkinson patients. And, you know, I wish all these people well, you know, I'm a fan of physiotherapists, but I'm an even greater fan of Parkinson patients. And I think if you are a Parkinson, you deserve an expert who treats many patients. So the therapists who are no longer seeing Parkinson patients should become network, part of another network, like the, the low back pain network or the rheumatoid arthritis network. But I think the time when everybody could do everything because we like it on our diet, you know, this is not a, a, an, an industry to spoil doctors or physiotherapists. It is, an, it is an industry designed to help patients. And patients deserve experts who treat many, many patients. So the resistance came from people who felt that everybody was allowed, had the right to see Parkinson patients. And, 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 and just to make clear, I'm not forbidding my patients to go to a generalist physiotherapist. What I do tell them is the odds that you will fracture your hip will be larger. The odds that this therapist will give you a treatment that is not according to guidelines are greater. And this is published work. If the patient says, well, but I love this guy, fine, you know, but just know your choice. And I think prior to Parkinson, it, you were left in the dark. You know, you were referred to God knows who, didn't know if he or she was good. And now patients can make a well-informed choice. And you can still opt for a, a generalist, fine, but do it based on facts. Right. Yeah, I think that's part is the important part. I mean, we, a lot of people, you know, email us every day, just not knowing, just having no idea that there's a difference. And um, so I think it's important to just know that um, there are specialists out there. There are people that are fully trained um, with Parkinson's. And yeah. at least if you can't get them, you know what questions to ask. So. Uh, well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today, and uh, I loved hearing all about it. I know that our community loves the Ending Parkinson's Disease book, and they're all on board with it. So uh, it's been a it's been a great thing to share and uh, let everybody know about it. So yeah, uh, can I just ask that that um, um, I, I hope people bought the book. Um, um, I'm not doing this because to generate my income, all proceeds go to Parkinson charities. And uh, if people like the book, write a positive review on Amazon. Uh, the book came out in the peak of the COVID crisis. And I think we did not receive as much attention as, as the book deserved. Uh, we have a pact on the website, endingpd.org. You can sign the pact. We, we hope that millions of people will sign it because with those signatures, we will go and speak to senators, to governments, you name it, to responsible bodies, to clean the environment and to create a better world for Parkinson's. The amount of funding going to Parkinson research is a fraction of what is going to other sources, uh, uh, to other, other diseases. So please sign the pact, buy the book, like the book and become an activist. I, I think we can only win the fight if we act together. You can tell I'm clearly very passionate about this, but we can't do it alone. We have to do it together. Absolutely. Yeah. And I will put all of those links um, in the post so that everybody can go right to it for sure. Right. I, for one, I'm very excited for your paper. I hope it comes out soon. Um, I think it's going to be really great. I can't wait to read all about it. So all right. Bye-bye. <laughs>